My name is Jocelyn and I am a guide with the Parramatta Visitor Information Centre. This is the Parramatta Female Factory site, a place of great historical significance where thousands of women lived and worked between 1821 and 1847. Parramatta Female Factory was both a workplace and a home for the many convict women who were not assigned as servants to settlers. It was a place of supervision, but also of protection from the male population of the colony. Its penitentiary provided a means of enforcing moral and social standards upon the convict and free women. The inmates worked at a range of jobs from spinning, weaving, bonnet making, to laundry and sewing. They were divided into three classes according to their crimes and behaviour. Separate work and privileges were allotted to the different classes. The female factory's longest serving superintendent was matron Anne Gordon and this is her story. Anne King was born in 1795 in the naval town of Portsmouth, England. Daughter to a government courier she received a basic education. At just 14 years of age, Anne had a baby daughter, Letitia. Three years later, Anne married Robert Gordon, an Irish military man. Robert joined the 48th Regiment, and in 1814, the couple went with it to Limerick, Ireland, where Anne gave birth to their first child. Letitia remained in England with her grandparents. Though Anne continued to seek reunions, and wrote affectionate letters to Letitia throughout her life, they were never to see each other again. Anne wrote to Letitia, You have a friend, a home and a mother that never forgot you, although length of time and circumstances and thousands of miles across the wide ocean separate us. In 1817, the 48th Regiment departed Cork for the colony of New South Wales to guard and escort the convicts. During the voyage, Anne gave birth to the couple's second daughter. When the family arrived in Sydney town, they were sent to join the Newcastle garrison. A son and daughter were born in Newcastle. When Robert's regiment departed for India in 1824, the Gordons decided to remain in the colony as free settlers. They were granted land in the Burragarang Valley, which they sold. The following year, 1825, Robert was employed as a storekeeper for the Commissariat in Sydney, soon after being transferred to the Parramatta Commissariat stores alongside Queen's Wharf. By 1827, Governor Darling was concerned at reports of mismanagement at the factory. He requested a competent replacement matron from Britain stating that he saw no chance of finding a suitable local candidate. Perhaps no interest was shown in Britain for the position, as Darling hired Anne, who may have gained experience in managing female convicts while stationed in Newcastle. Anne secured the role as matron of the Parramatta Female Factory in October 1827, a position she held until 1836. At a salary of £150 per annum, she was one of the highest paid women in the colony, earning more than her husband. Her salary included these spacious, well-appointed quarters and offices, overlooking large areas of the factory. From here she could survey her domain. Her husband Robert was appointed storekeeper and managed requisitions and provisions from a range of storerooms, including this one. He must have felt totally under his wife's thumb. Anne was expected to ensure the smooth running of the female factory, to maintain the health and welfare of the women, to alleviate overcrowding where possible, to provide gainful employment in the workshops and to encourage moral improvement. She also needed to display an entrepreneurial flair, selling the range of garments and household linen produced by the factory inmates, from petticoats to pillowcases. Governor Darling recognised the difficulties in meeting these expectations 
and commended Matron Gordon on her ability to meet them. Anne managed a large staff from here, including two or three assistant matrons, a clerk, a porteress and a gatekeeper, who were stationed over here where the gates once were. The factory hospital played an important role in the provision of medical care for the female convicts and also other colonial women, and it was situated conveniently over here. A major challenge for Anne was dealing equitably with a wide spectrum of women, from those who had committed minor infringements to those who had committed serious crimes and even disruptive political prisoners. At any one time, many inmates were either pregnant, frail or ill, and they could be found in the hospital here, which was run by a matron with helpers chosen from the best behaved convict women. Mental health issues were common, not surprisingly, given that the women had been uprooted from families and homes and sent into the unknown over which they had no control. As an added complication, many women had their young children with them, while others were forcibly separated from their older children. Anne's experience of being separated from her well-beloved first-born daughter, while following her soldiering husband from post to post around the world, would surely have built empathy between Anne and her charges. Tis said in the third class, like pigs we are fed, on harmony salted and brown filthy bread, that sunrise to sunset we work till we groan, all dragging huge barrows and loaded with stone. Home. We laugh at all those slanders and love well our home. One of the ongoing problems was overcrowding. The factory was built to house 300, but when Anne arrived there were 366 inmates, which rose to over 600 women and children under the rule of Governor Burke. This caused a worsening of conditions and led to further behavioural issues. However, on the whole, life was mostly peaceful. I'm standing here in the third class penitentiary workshop. If you look up on the walls, you can see the marks where the floor was for the dormitory located above. Portholes like these provided the only light to the women's dormitory. Well-behaved women enjoyed some minor freedoms, but punishments for misdemeanours were harsh. They included being sent here to the third class to break rocks, pull apart filthy old ropes for recycling as ships corking, spend time in solitary confinement or have your hair shaved off. Head shaving was particularly resented by the women. Home, home, sweet, sweet home. In spite of the head shaving, there's no place like home. This is the third class penitentiary yard. As you can see from the archaeological activity, which is throwing new light on the lives of the women, this is a very significant site. Immediately on Anne's arrival, ration cuts led to the first of several riots at the factory. On the 21st of October, the previous matron had been assaulted after reducing the women's tea and sugar rations. Two days later, just as matron Gordon took up her duties, a group of third-class women rioted by overtaking this yard. The action led to their new matron to announce that she would cut all bread and sugar rations. In response, over 100 of the women then attacked workmen, stealing hammers and sledges to break down the gates and then rioting through the streets of Parramatta. The fact they stole mainly bread and meat attests to the reason for the riot. After the majority were recaptured, rations were restored and peace returned. During a later riot in 1831, the women seized Anne and forcibly cut her hair before again storming the streets of Parramatta. A major role the factory played was as an employment agency, with Anne arranging positions for suitable inmates as farm and domestic servants. One of her stranger duties was to organise marriages turning the matron's office behind me into a makeshift matchmaking agency. Following a request from an approved suitor, 
a selection of well-behaved volunteers would line up for assessment by the prospective groom. He would chat to the women individually before making his choice. If the chosen woman agreed to the match, a wedding would follow before the couple departed the factory for their new lives. Occasionally, when the suitor could not decide on a bride, the matron would select a match for him. So the currency lads may fill up their glasses and drink to the health of the currency lasses. The lass I adore, the lass for me, is a lass in the female factory. By the mid-1830s, reports reached London about the immoral conduct by members of the matron's own family, including her husband. Robert's position as factory storekeeper was terminated in 1835, placing Anne in a very difficult position. Gossip was also rife regarding her daughter Caroline. While Anne was not implicated and was said by Governor Burke to be a valuable public servant herself, he noted she had the misfortune to be surrounded by an ill-conducted family. In September 1836, Burke informed his superiors of major reforms at the factory. It was to be re-established on a prison footing and the services of Mrs Gordon terminated. Although he stated no blame was attached to her. She was given one year's wages in compensation, perhaps the first redundancy payment in New South Wales. The Gordons initially remained at Parramatta, where in 1837, Robert held a publican's licence for the Jolly Sailor Hotel. The Gordons were unfortunate to lose the licence when their application for renewal was submitted just one day late. More misfortune followed in 1838, when Anne sought reappointment as matron of the factory and was rejected. By the early 1840s, the family had moved to Maitland. A letter from Anne to her daughter Letitia in 1845 indicates the financial and personal stresses Anne suffered at this time. She wrote, The three girls and their children are at present at home with me, and as for their father, I've had to keep him for these last 10 years without his earning one single shilling, but spending all he can get. A letter by her granddaughter records that regarding a property of Anne's, it is a house that Grandma built, intending to leave it to her children. But one day, the poor woman was informed that it was no longer hers. Her husband had sold it without her knowledge. She also had a farm that went the same way. Had she been left to herself, she would have been a very rich woman. Anne continued to seek government appointments. In 1848, she unsuccessfully applied for the post of matron at Tarbon Creek Asylum. Robert died in 1863, followed five years later by Anne, who died of bronchitis, aged 73, at East Maitland where she is buried at St Peter's Burial Ground with Robert, her daughter Caroline and a grandson. Anne Gordon was one of the very few women to hold a position of power and influence in the colony. In her personal life, she displayed the fortitude to overcome a range of setbacks and support her unruly family. As matron of the Parramatta Female Factory, the decisions she made impacted the lives of a multitude of women from whom it is estimated one in seven Australians is descendant. Perhaps some of the women's future successes can be put down to Anne's influence. <laughs>